Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to Afrofuturism's Reimagined Tomorrow's Event. This is a future tense event hosted by New America. I'm Yatasha Womack. I'm author of the book, Afrofuturism, the world of black sci-fi and fantasy culture. I'm a theorist. I'm a filmmaker, I'm a practitioner of Afrofuturism, and I teach dance therapy around Afrofuturism as well. And it is such a pleasure to be moderating this event for you. Want to give a special thank you to Future Tits and New America's event staff. They are amazing and they brought us all together. And when I'm saying us, who am I talking about? I'm talking about the fantastic uh, Dr. Nyango Lamumba Kasanga and Ka Fabrice Garrier. Hello, oh. this is so exciting. Woohoo! Hello, and Happy New Year. Oh, goodness, Happy New Year to you. <laughs> what a great year it is, full of joy and enthusiasm as we are moving upwards and onwards. Well, tell me, well, okay, so whenever I do these talks, I always like to start off with just an explanation of what Afrofuturism is. And Afrofuturism is a way of looking at the future or alternate realities, but through a Black cultural lens. And when I say Black, I'm not just talking about Black people in the United States, but Black people in the diaspora, whether they're in Brazil or Jamaica, the Caribbean, Latin America, Europe, and of course, the continent of Africa and elsewhere. Um, Afrofuturism is an artistic aesthetic in that you do see it in music and you're thinking about Janelle Monet, uh, you see it in film like Black Panther, of course, but Afrofuturism is also a, uh, it's a, an epistemology or philosophy. Um, it's a, a methodology. And when I say a methodology, meaning it could be a practice. And it is for many people, a way of pushing past uh, any limitations they have around the imagination and having a sense of agency in the future. So it intersects the imagination, liberation, technology, mysticism, and Black cultures. And it is also, uh, it, it differs from a lot of other takes on the future because it values the divine feminine, it values intuition, it sees mysticism and technology as being integrated. And it is, uh, you know, most exciting to me because there's so much value of the imagination and visioning. Uh, and it reclaims a lot of the philosophies in the African uh, continent and the diaspora and how they really synergize. So when we talk about Afrofuturism, we're really talking about where the diaspora and the continent meet with respect to how they see uh, futures uh, and, and how they see histories. Uh, in Afrofuturism, time is nonlinear. So people are informed by futures in the same way they're informed by histories. Uh, time is not moving on the straight line. We're kind of synergizing all these points in one. And you see that when you look at, say, Parliament Funkadelic album covers, uh, if you're looking at even the cover for my Afrofuturism book, um, if you look at the, the cover for the new book, Infinitum, uh, and you think about a lot of the music, it, it has some serious time travel elements to it where there's very much a timelessness. So now that we have that established, I would love to uh, just kind of read uh, the bios of our special guest here. Uh, before we start asking them some questions. Fabrice Garrier is a Haitian American author, a member of the World Economic Forum, DC Global Shaper Community, and a Forbes 30 Under 30 class of 2021 uh, individual highlighted for his art and style. He is a founder of sci-fi and fantasy production house, Syllable, uh, where he helps writers hack their fullest creative potential through collaboration and crowdsourcing, his aim is to bring more access and opportunities to underrepresented voices and BIPOC or BIPOC, speculative fiction writers, while activating new political, sociocultural, and technological imaginations for a more just future. And we all want a more just future. Uh, so thank you, uh, Fabrice, if you could just wave to the crowd. <laughs> Hello there, virtual audience. And also, Dr. Nyango Lamumba Kasango is a gateway 
postdoctoral fellow who's in the Department of Music. Oh, exciting, where she teaches courses in rap songwriting and feminist sound studies. She earned her PhD in science and technology studies from Cornell University in 2019. Her doctoral research explores the politics of community studios, a term she has developed for fixed and mobile recording studios that prioritize working with artists from underserved communities, as well as women and non-binary artists. In addition, uh, she performs original music as a producer and rapper under the moniker Samus, uh, which is so exciting. I've seen her perform. She's quite amazing. And in 2019, she began working as the director of audio at Glow Up Games, a women of color led game studio responsible for developing a rap composition video game based on the HBO scripted series Insecure. Oh, that sounds really cool. So we have two fantastic individuals with us today. And I have the pleasure of getting to ask them questions about uh, reimagining tomorrows through the lens of Afrofuturism. And my first question for both of you is how did you find your voice in Afrofuturism? I want to go first. Go, go for it, Fabrice. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Um, I'm extremely delighted to be uh, part of this conversation uh, with New America and, and really talking about something that's so extremely important right now. Um, for me, I think it, it began back in Haiti uh, when I was just a little boy. And, and I think a lot of what we learn in the classroom is that we're the first independent black country in the world and we look very much into the past. Um, but when I moved to the US when I was 13, a lot of my identity as an Haitian was very much challenged. Um, and I tried to find my voice in many different avenues and and really, I felt that a lot of the template reality that was given to me or that I had access to wasn't enough to capture the full depth and imagination of a lot of the inequities or the social problems or the, the historical traumas that I have come to realize still plagues our world. And especially for people of African descent, I, I feel like there is almost a missed opportunity because I feel a lot of the voices of the African descent people, which makes up a lot of big chunk of the planet is, is sort of pushed aside. And I think when you have a narrow view of, of how you define the future, a lot of that creativity, a lot of that imagination, um, I think is, is pushed aside as well. So you're gonna end up with systems that don't honor liberation, that doesn't honor love. I think my personal voice for Afrofuturism was this realization that our current model, despite the, the innovations and the greatness that we claim it to be, there's still so much farther we have to be. I worked in a library in high school and that was my way of escaping the world. And I read comics um, and stories and books um, and traveled to different worlds. And I tried to imagine, I love what you said, Natasha, about informed by the future. I think we always think about how the past informs us right now, but I think it's so important to realize that how we see the future and the limitation, the imagination about the future can impact our current society right now on the most profound collective level. Um, I'll stop with that. No, that's great. And it's, it's cool to hear that you're a library kid because uh, I, I prided myself on reading all the Black biographies in the kids section um, when I was uh, a, a kid. And I kept wondering, why are all these celebrities keep going to Paris in the 40s? What is with that? Uh, <laughs> and at the time, I barely knew anyone who had left the country. I said, wow, they, they were so uh, ahead of their time. Uh, but it was a great lens and read so many science books there as well. And uh, reading, I think, as a kid, shaping our perspectives is amazing. Uh, but I agree, you know, that reclaiming uh, and, and really trying to find your, your voice in a future has led us to, to create um, some of the stories that we've created. Um, what about you, Dr. Nyango? How did you find your voice? 
Um, so first, again, let me just echo what Fabrice said about being so excited to be in this space. I'm just really juiced. I can't, I can't stop smiling. My cheeks are going to hurt after this conversation. But um, I think for me, my voice was the product of trying to find an aesthetic that I, or, or trying to find a word or a phrase or a thing or a concept that could speak to the aesthetics that I was drawn to and that I found myself producing in art. And I didn't really know where that fit until kind of stumbling into this universe where all these folks had been making this art and had been having these conversations and dialogue. So a large part of that for me was I, I grew up in Ithaca, New York and upstate New York. Um, my parents, my dad's from the Congo, my mom's from the Ivory Coast, and we were one of very few Black families, one of very few immigrant families in Ithaca. So really, my universe was my brain. Like, my head was where I spent a lot of time. So both of you are book nerds. I feel very kindred. We're kindred spirits. I spent a lot of time reading and just trying to, to kind of craft worlds in my brain. And I became really attached to video games and video game universes in particular. So as I was growing up, the Nintendo, the Sega Genesis, the Super Nintendo, these systems were starting to become more popular. And even though the games I played didn't reflect me as a black girl um, trying to find her voice, there was something about being able to explore in these universes that really spoke to me. So I kept returning to video games first in terms of the music. I loved video game music and wanted to craft video game music when I grew up and learned how to kind of produce, but even in terms of the aesthetics. So once I started um, kind of making music and rapping and producing after I graduated from college, a lot of the frames of reference for my hip hop became video games. Like I was always thinking about myself in terms of video games. And of course, talking about my race gendered experience of the world, but also linking that into popular video game discourses. So it became this kind of interesting mix of, of like black feminist thought and, and video game ideas and identities. And as I started sharing my music, more folks were directing me to artists who were doing similar kinds of things, who were engaging with parts of geek culture, um, you know, black radical traditions, black feminist thought, and were bringing them together. And it was finally, I think around 2010, 2011, when somebody said, oh, the music you make is nerdcore music, which is like hip hop that is infused with sort of like geek identities. But I felt like that wasn't the right fit because it didn't center kind of black ideas or blackness at the core of what you know was driving that musical form. So then I was introduced to Afrofuturism and I felt like this speaks to what I'm trying to get at by placing myself in these video game universes uh, and, and trying to take them on as an artist and trying to tell a story that both um, speaks to who I am, but also envisions a world in which the characters in the games look like me and look like my friends and tell our story. So I think it was definitely yearning for an aesthetic and then realizing that there was this whole universe of folks who were already in conversation about um, what this aesthetic means, I think, like you said, in practice and as a politic, and that really awakened some things for me. Yeah, it's so interesting because I, I frequently say that I was an Afrofuturist and didn't know I was an Afrofuturist. Uh, and that while the term itself was created in the 90s and, and referenced or, or used in an essay called Black to the Future um, by uh, Mark Derry and actually popularized in part because Alondra Nelson started her um, late 90s, early 2000s listserv, uh, Dr. Alondra Nelson. Um, she created this listserv where she brought a lot of people together using that term Afrofuturism to really intersect these ideas of liberation, technology, mysticism, uh, and Black culture and the imagination. Uh, but that term, uh, you know, it, it still was sort of slow to get into stream, uh, into conversation with other people beyond those circles who were really working with these terms. And I, I remember hearing the term for the first time and, you know, having started my career off as a journalist thinking, wait a second, why haven't I heard this term before? You know, I've been writing about culture. I'm into sci-fi. I like science. I like, you know, fantasy. Uh, but more specifically, I was more excited about kind of claiming a voice uh, in uh, Black culture because uh, a lot of the works presented to us 
didn't show that. I think one of my Genesis moments was being a kid and watching both The Wiz and Roots, the miniseries. Mm -hmm. So there's this complicated history. Um, there's this family story, but then there's also this world of magic, wonder, and fantasy. And I think that played a big role in how I saw Afrofuturism. Uh, I'm, and I'm wondering for, so that said, the term is a big deal. And um, because, yeah. you know, there are people working with that term, working with the ideas who didn't know the term. And the term, I think, anchored a lot of creatives, a lot of theorists, um, and also helped to create a, provide a new lens for people who have been doing work in that area before. And to that mm -hmm. extent, helped empower people working mm -hmm. in that area and, and help people find their works. And I'm wondering, uh, what is it about Afrofuturism that excites you, though? I I, I want to respond to a lot of the things that were said before. I think I also I'll merge what uh, what excites me. I I, I feel like w when a group of people are tied to a, a sort of level of consciousness, it allows movement building, allows social change, systems change to happen at a much faster rate. I think what what excites me about Afrofuturism is so much of the world like. I totally agree with with Samus is that like I didn't see myself represented in stories or in films and, and movies. And and just by the fact of me being black, I think there's this whole wealth of, of knowledge from philosophers, from writers, from black activists, uh, radical like thought in terms of how do we shape our world around like and how do we do this without fear? And I feel like Afrofuturism provides, I don't know, I just think like it's its such a powerful way to kind of captivate people of African descent, but also people that are not from African descent to mm -hmm. understand what does it take to lift ourselves up in a way that we, from a bottom up process, I think it's, because I think a lot of change sometimes comes from a very top down. And I feel like Afrofuturism is, is very much like a bottom up, like from the heart to the mind, to the future. And it's it's almost in, in terms of embracing where you come from and that I can tell the story and I'm part of this story and I can co-create this future. I don't know, I think there's a lot of innovations happening a lot of revolutions that's happening right now across the board, whether it's politically, technologically or climate change issues. I, I feel like we need new ideas and, and Afrofuturism can provide that. Uh, not only on an interpersonal level, but also on a collective level, um, and in allowing people to really understand something that's been left out, um, out, out of their just the broader cultural streams of thought. Right, really claiming uh, these aspects of the culture uh, that, for any number of reasons, um, people didn't get to engage in those thoughts um, mm -hmm. from a, a global standpoint. You know, I mean, we're all human beings. And these experiences and this wealth of information that comes from the from the contemplations of people in the continent and the diaspora uh, can really help everyone. And but it's still good to claim that it's coming from those spaces, uh, because so much of modernity and new futures um, have been shaped sometimes by Black thought without always getting the credit for that. Mm -hmm. uh, what about you, um, Dr. Nyango? What what uh, how are you inspired by? Yeah. when it inspires you, excites you about it. I think what's so exciting to me about Afrofuturism in part is that because it comes from the sort of sci-fi um, speculative future space, it has so much to do with storytelling. It emphasizes for me the importance of storytelling within our society culturally. And as we, you know, many of us know in in African, West African traditions, the storyteller, the bard takes, you know, is a very important figure in society. And that continues, I think, throughout various Black lineage, lineages where storytelling, orality, being able to craft an experience in terms of a story is like a really critical way of conveying, I think, what Fabrice is talking about, how we can change things, how we can, can create some momentum around something. So I'm really excited by the framework of thinking about our reality as a story that we're actively writing into, we're actively building and addressing and engaging. And, you know, if for me, coming from 
science and technology studies, it's, it's really interesting to think about the areas of overlap and dissonance because in some regard, you know, STS is very committed to this idea that the world is socially constructed, right? The truth, science and technology are, um, you know, human made endeavors and we have to keep that at the core. But on the other hand, there are ways in which black understandings of the world um, don't necessarily make it into the canon, right? And, and the relationships between, as you're talking about, Yatasha, mysticism and technology, those things are, are separated. And so there's a way in which Afrofuturism tries to reconcile and through storytelling tries to reconcile um, these ways of understanding the world. So I'm just really, really excited that it enables us to to think in terms of storytelling about every endeavor that we try to, to pursue in the future, present, past. Right, absolutely. Uh, yes, Fabrice. No, I was just gonna echo uh, what uh, Dr. Inongo said in terms of, of like, it's all about meaning and it's like, the, our meaning geography needs to evolve. And so, uh, oftentimes that meaning has been very violent in terms of now allowing us to express the full depth and spectrum of, of what we can be as human beings. And I think collectively, like I really like what you said around the storytelling. It's we're actively going in and reshaping and adding our, our modules. Um, I think that's very powerful. I think it's so true. I think it's, it is about storytelling and, and we have to claim that story and we, we each have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the relationship to the future, you know, I mean, I think one of the interesting things uh, is that Afrofuturism seems so novel for some people because they're using the word, you know, a variation of the word Africa and future and the same, mm -hmm. you know, word and um, suddenly realize that they don't always associate those two things together. Uh, and, you know, that creates a bit of cognitive dissonance of, wait a minute, you know, um, what kind of ideas am I socialized into? What am I not connecting with? You know, what aspects of myself am I denying? Uh, mm. Because I'm, you know, sort of being shaped into an idea of not just who I am, but how my future is supposed to be. And, uh, you know, I just find that really fascinating. Uh, earlier, Fabrice, you had talked about Afrofuturism and it's feeling very sort of uh, bottom up in terms of its energy. And it made me think about, you know, for people who are into dance or into yoga, this idea of moving energy up your root chakra, uh, kind of up your core and, you know, out into the, the stratosphere. Uh, and and Afrofuturism is very much aligned, I think, in that way. Can you name any individuals who in recent years, uh, well, not just recent years, anyone, maybe they're a historical figure, maybe they're a contemporary artist or thinker today, who because of this term Afrofuturism, you now see their work in a, a different lens. Um, I can jump in here. There's an, an artist whom I absolutely adore. She's um, Philadelphia-based, more mother. Um, Kame Ayewa. Um, she's part of a collective called Black Quantum Futurism. And um, I just have been so drawn to her work because she actively refuses labels. She actively refuses labels in every aspect of her work that I think is so remarkable and freeing. And as we're thinking about future spaces, right, the one of the issues we run up against is using our contemporary labels for a space that hasn't even come to be yet. <laughs> and so I think in her refusal of these, you know, genre, right? Like the kind of tyranny of genre, it's, it's for me a deliberatory practice of thinking about, well, why do I, as you were saying, um, Itasha, why do I think in these ways? Why do I immediately call myself indie rap artist? Like, where does this label come from? And why is that the only framework that I would be, you know, calling my music or thinking about where it fits or my practice? So I just love the work that she's doing. And I also love how her collective thinks a lot about time. Um, and it's helped me to think a little bit about um, what it means to liberate ourselves from the constructs of, of how time functions, uh, kind of capitalist time and industrial time, and really thinking about those structures in my life and how they've enforced 
ideas of success and failure and where I need to be, who I need to be, you know, in a particular timeline. So I just I encourage everybody, M-O-O-R, mother, please look up her music, buy all of her music, band camp, and support her because she's um, really trying to do a lot of interesting things and have many, many dialogues. Yeah, more mother is fascinating. I'm glad you brought her up as an artist. Um, and I have to just acknowledge before I, I turn the, the question to you, Fabrice, uh, Dr. Nyango, in your performances, you have a robotic arm. Yes. Can you talk <laughs> a bit about that? <laughs> yes, I would love to. So the character that my rap name Samus comes from a particular video game character named Samus with one M. And in the video game Metroid, where she comes from, at the end of the game, you've played the game in, in this armor suit. And when the armor suit is removed, you learn that this character is this, this woman. And you know, the game came out in 1987. So there were, there were not many playable women characters at that point. So this was really a revelation for me. I was very shocked. And it, it forced me to challenge some gendered ideas I had been thinking through in my, my little kid brain. Um, and she has this giant arm cannon as part of her, her, um, her cybernetic power suit. So when I adopted this name and decided that I wanted to kind of tell her story as my story, it felt like, you know, I want to do this in a way that reflects some of the iconography of that story. Because so many video game folks are familiar with that. So it will be this radical moment um, when I'm the person who wears the arm cannon. Um, and so I, I uh, have a friend in Chicago, she put this arm cannon together for me and, um, and so I wear it during shows when I'm performing songs that are part of this, um, this EP that I put together to honor the story of Samus. And it's been a really, it's made me think about cosplay within an Afrofuturist lens. It was something that I hadn't sort of associated or understood in that way, but thinking about all of the black cosplayers who are inhabiting realities that maybe they weren't a part of or <laughs> um, repurposing, bringing in materials and, um, uh, you know, patterns, designs that reshape the original aesthetic, I think is just like the coolest thing ever. So yeah, that's how my, my arm cannon kind of fits in. <laughs> Right. No, that's so fascinating. Um, yeah, I have to give you your props. You're talking about more mother. I was like, well, wait a second here. Yeah, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and for Brees, um, you know, tell us, is there a person who's kind of coming to mind when you're thinking about Afrofuturism, historical figure, a person today um, that, I don't know, you just have a different take on? Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, like, I think the seeds were, were interwoven so, and in, like so much in the past as like a Haitian, I'm going to bring back the Haitian revolution again. I, I feel you like- You always bring up the Haitian revolution. Mm -hmm. that is That's right. <laughs> I feel like a group of, of African descent people and also Europeans as well, who dreamed of a different future where where everywhere around the world, black bodies were being sold. Um, and I feel that is such an Afrofuturist thought, like just me just really digesting of what does it mean to be connected to that past and that history. I feel like for me that, that the Haitian revolution and what it stands for and like birthing Latin American history and, and, and unfolding this sort of breath that I'm still feeling to this day. I feel like I have to like mention that first. I feel like that has for sure influenced me the most in terms of reshaping my aesthetic and in a way that I can own myself in a way that I can breathe in a way that I can create so I think that I bring that I bring those people with me like wherever I go um and, and the art that I create and the, the words that I that I speak because it's just like to imagine that in 1804 people were dreaming of a future where they they like everyone around them was like that future is crazy like you cannot live fully human and and those aspects um but to and also to to fast forward a little bit i think just i think a lot of black thoughts such as like james baldwin or octavia butler i'm diving into a lot of octavia butler's stories right now i feel their words and their visions are so prophetic in terms of what's happening in society because it, it almost seems that a lot of what they're talking about these cycles just keeps repeating 
over and over and over. Like the, the historical trauma passed down like in our physical black bodies in the system encoded in our culture and the incentivization and how systems are built to incentivize certain structures. I feel by that fact, these writers are speaking to something so eternally. But I, I feel like my question, I think I wanna maybe ask the group is like, where does Afrofuturism come in and how do we evolve those, those cycles of violence that like evolve and turn to different faces and different structures, but have the same core essence? Like, how do we heal? And I feel like Afrofuturism has a role to play in that. Yeah, and I'm glad that you brought that up, actually, because people often ask, uh, you know, they talk about Afrofuturism, they say, man, there's so much discussion of history uh, in, in Afrofuturism. And, and again, you know, these are paradigms where people are being informed by histories and futures um, to transform a present, almost as if these times are really sort of layered. Uh, and uh, I think when you, you talk about how you break those sorts of cycles, I think the reclaiming of some of these other wisdom systems and um, that lens paired with some of the technologies uh, provides a great, provides a lot of insight for people and, and provides a lot with respect to resilience. Um, and we have a couple questions coming in uh, and I'm gonna to get to some of those in about 10 minutes. Um, so, so just hold on and, and continue to, to put them out there. Uh, I, I want to just, uh, you know, I think it's really interesting. I'm wondering if you can comment a bit on uh, this idea of uh, why futures and histories are, are so synergized. You know, what's the value in that? Um, you know, for some people, we're like, well, when are you going to talk about the future? And they're like, well, wait a second. <laughs> um, there's a reason, and I, I like to mention the Sankofa, uh, the idea of Sankofa, and for some of you might be familiar with it, it's a, uh, it's a symbol, and um, uh, it comes out of Ghana that really, it's an image of a bird looking back at its tail, an egg on its tail, and, you know, it's kind of an awkward looking image, but the point is that you're looking at the past um, and as you're moving forward. You know, mm -hmm. meaning, and not that you're moving backwards and you're, <laughs> but essentially mm -hmm. that you're looking to be uh, looking at the pulling from the best of these histories um, mm -hmm. and moving forward. And I think for people of African descent, especially, the resilience that comes from that is so valuable. Um, and I, I just want to, I'm wondering in your, I'm thinking about someone like W.B. Du Bois, right? Who both, uh, was this theorist, you know, pretty much he, he articulated some of the core issues that people would contemplate in the 20th century. And he was starting to think about these ideas in the 1890s, uh, <laughs> ironically enough. Um, but then simultaneously, we find that he did create, write sci-fi stories. Um, he wrote the comet, he wrote a fantasy story. Um, one of those stories inspired Megascope, uh, which is an imprint held by John Jennings. It has graphic novels coming out, and I can probably talk a bit about that later. But uh, I'm wondering for you, what is this relationship between this theory, these contemplations on these histories and futures, and the creative process? Because you both pull from um, from these, you know, Fabrice with the work that you're doing. And please tell us a little more about this, uh, this storytelling uh, uh, crowdsourcing entity that you have. And same thing with you, Dr. Nyango. Uh, you are pulling, you know, as a theorist, you're, you're pairing that with your work as a rap artist. And I'm just hoping, and obviously I do the same, but I want to hear more about the, that as a lens for you. Uh, because I think it's a big part of the, the Afrofuturist methodology. So do you want to go? <laughs> sure, sure. I can jump in here. Um, but I think it's a really fabulous question because um, it pulls it from the level of just the kind of conceptual into the, the, the um, realm of practice. Like how in our daily lives and in our work is this beautiful way of thinking about the world emerging. And I would say for me, one of the, just going back to what you were saying, even before the question that I, I found so profound about this conversation between past, 
present future, um, is that there's a fundamental narrative, uh, you know, Western narrative around progress that has been so destructive <laughs> to this, you know, the environment, to people, <laughs> to, you know, just our, our understanding of the world, this narrative of progress and a, a move forward rather than kind of circular and constantly in conversation. And so I think as an artist, one of the ways that I see that being beneficial is that I can think about my art as me being in conversation with myself. Um, and one of the ways that that emerges is that I can speak about a thing in a particular time, and then I can speak about that same thing later and have grown and changed and kind of have a call back to that earlier moment in my career. So for example, I have songs that I've released where I articulate one point and then I change my mind. And I decide, you know what, I'm gonna write a song that responds to that <laughs> or responds to this earlier me who was thinking in this way. And so if you're thinking in terms of, of progress, maybe it doesn't allow space for you to be in conversation with past versions of yourself or be in conversation with others. So I think it's really rooted in, you know, other Black forms of art making that have to do with loops and cycles and always kind of being in conversation with the past, but really thinking about how to do that in a way that breaks down hierarchy, that breaks down notions of progress that are really debilitating, I think, for artists. Um, in trying to think of what are the other frameworks I can use for growing my craft than the ones that are, are commonly presented and that put things in this binaries of good, bad. Um, so I think that's sort of how it comes, comes across in my practice is how can I speak to myself and leave room for growth and, and I guess evolution is maybe another way of thinking about that, that concept. Yeah, one of the postmodern examples of that uh, which we sort of take for granted is the hip hop culture of remixing. Mm -hmm, you know, whether it's mm -hmm, DJs mm -hmm. remixing, pulling different samples, uh, and it yeah. really deconstru deconstructs time. Um, yep. It's a, a collage in some ways, but it, it uh, is more of like a, a musical symbolism of, of something mm -hmm. that people of African descent have been doing for some time, which is pulling from these different fabrics. Um, pulling from histories and futures and, and kind of, you're always sort of preserving, but in this very sort of non-traditional format. Um, mm -hmm. uh, well, in, in traditional, I, I use that somewhat loosely uh, because there's a tradition in, in, in doing that. It's just one that's uh, typically African. Uh, and you saw it in the quilt work in the past and you see it mm -hmm. in how people live their lives. Um, and some of the approaches to not just creativity, but just uh, thinking and, and looking on new futures. Uh, and what about you, Fabrice? Yeah, I think there's much to unpack. I, 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 think, I my first thought is that I feel like I, I would love to comment. I think it was Krishna Murthy that said, like, the greatest art is the art of living. And I always, I always feel like humanity is is our artist, and I think a lot of people don't see themselves as creative, don't see themselves as artists, and I think there is a, like a moral obligation to see ourselves as creators, and and to go to what Dr. Inongo said in terms of like finding different spatial time ways of navigating the world, I totally agree. I think our current spatial dialectic in terms of like how modernity has framed nations in terms of okay this nation in 15 years is going to be more like this nation and 15 years is going to be more like the U.S. And then if you put the U.S., if every country was like the U.S., like that finite mindset with infinite, with that infinite mindset with finite resources, it's like we're bound for destruction. I think we need th that circular level of, of time bound, like time, timeless thinking in terms of like, how can we from different aspects of ourselves different histories of ourselves and how it synthesizes in the future. And I really appreciate what you meant with uh, mysticism as well, Yatasha. I think, I think there is a, 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 such a fundamental mystical aspect to being human and also being from the people of African descent in terms of transcending the two dimensional good or bad paradigm or even the three dimensional. If you start going up, it's time itself is a dimension. So I think when you start to really engage your creative process 
and you start to create weight reality as stories, as meaning making creatures, I think there is something so empowering in terms of the imagination and, 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 and leveraging everything on the table to reshape something with new ideas, not with the same ideas. Um, mm -hmm. And also to connect with some of the questions in the work in syllable, I think the, the basic premise of syllable, the, the sci-fi and fantasy production house I found it is, is that writers can go further together. And, and I personally feel like a lot of creatives or even I would say specifically writers, they're very nomadic, they're very hunter-gatherers, they're by themselves. And they, so was like, they want to go in their cave and work on their like great art. And, and I think that's great. I'm that way too. But I feel like in the context that we're living right now, like big creative brands are choking out creativity. They're not giving people permission to thrive and, and not only economically, but also on their very well-being level. So, so my work with Syllable is really trying to radically like engage something that has existed, the idea of collectives. How do we bring creatives together to imagine a fictional world and leverage that world so they can write together? And then we help them get their work out there. And I think there's also another piece in terms of, of that, that collective genius and in, in leveraging that so people can really imagine. And I really love what you said as well with the storyteller in West Africa, how the, the storyteller is so important in African societies. I think storytellers are going to play a critical role in the next 10, 20 years and allowing people to imagine a future that they never thought could be possible because there's a lot of people that I, I it saddens me to say that they like the ability to imagine something different doesn't come naturally to them in terms of their gifts or in terms of how the society has molded so much around what's possible and not possible. So I think storytellers and the change in technology, I think something like syllable could not have existed, let's say 50 years ago. So this is my attempt to, to galvanize the collective force and creative force of writers to work in, uh, in, in collectives, in shared universes, and also advance their work through that universe instead of working um, by themselves, mm -hmm. like very nomadically in the, in the way that they kind of create short stories and books. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is a really fascinating time because it's after Black Panther has come to prominence. And uh, when we did a Future Tense talk a couple of years ago about Afrofutures, and it was before Black Panther, uh, the film had arrived, obviously Black Panther hit on all notes, the, the mysticism, the technology, the imagination, liberation, uh, and the Black cultural themes, um, which made it one of the most amazing Marvel films uh, and, and just a special film for a lot of people around the world. Uh, uh, but we're also in a period where we, you know, I had a really interesting year with 2020. Uh, I say interesting lightly. And we're in a, a, a time where we have a new administration. Uh, and I'm just wondering, how did you use Afrofuturism to, uh, uh, how did you use Afrofuturism? Or what insights did you gain into it moving into 2021? And I'll go first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm first for this question. Uh, for me, you know, I always talked about Afrofuturism as resilience. And when, you know, with the onset of some of the things in, in 2020, you know, I found myself thinking very deeply about ancestors, people in the past, uh, what they did, but then also what are the things you need around you to keep you high, in a high vibration? Um, because, you know, I think one thing that Afrofuturism reminds us of is that it, and you don't want to capitulate to the moment because the moment does not necessarily define who you are and it's also temporal. Uh, and so in that, where is it you're trying to go and who do you need to be to stay in vibration with that goal? Uh, and that had me thinking of things that were really basic, you know, what colors do I need to wear? What music do I need to listen to? Um, what kind of, am I dancing? Am I with the community? Who am I talking to? Um, you know, what foods am I eating? Uh, what teas am I drinking? You know, all sorts of things, you know, what nurtures your soul that still kind of stays in the realm of basics. 
um, became really, really uh, an interesting contemplation for me. Uh, and what about the, the two of you? And then I'll move to our exciting audience questions. Um, I can just jump in quickly, I think, um, and echoing everything that you said about really listening, listening, you know, to the, those very sort of a bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, <laughs> you know, needs, am I hungry, am I tired, and what's really going on physiologically right now that needs attention and care. Um, I think the other thing is um, someone like more mother and Sun Ra have often made, um, are often referenced in relation to the ideas of the apocalypse, like the end of the world, right? And, and one of their key insights is that the apocalypse has already happened. Like, let's say that the apocalypse already took place. Now what? You know, and so instead of kind of sitting and in and, and the anxiety of like, when is the end of the world coming? It's like the end of the world came a million times over and over again. So now we're in a space of rebuilding. Like if we're to imagine that this already took place, we've survived. And so, there's a way that we can carve a path forward. And I found that to just be so, particularly over the summer, I think it was really, really hard to, to find the strength to get, to get out of bed, to not be um, angry, to the enraged to the point of not, you know, being able to, to really sleep or take care of those basic needs. But I think thinking about it, like these are our growing pains and we are, are moving through something and not towards an end, um, was really, really powerful for me as an insight. Yeah, I never saw it as an end. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that makes Afro features and probably a little different from cyberpunk moments, you know, there's always this idea of moving towards the end of the world. Uh, when for some of us, colonization or the transatlantic slave trade, those were ends of worlds. Um, and we're obviously on the other side of that. Uh, and it, it changes your, the lens of a thing um, in an interesting kind of way. I'm glad you mentioned Sun Ra, who's usually mentioned all the time in these talks, and, and we're getting around to him now <laughs> at this point in the program. Hey there, Fabrice, what about you? Is there these moments of, of resilience and contemplation around Afrofuturism uh, coming out of 2020, moving into 2021? Absolutely. I think last year was an unimaginable, like, I don't even know how, I don't even have words to describe what last year was in terms of collectively what was happening um, with the racial unrest, George Floyd, or, or even politically what was going on. I felt that I told, to, I, that resonates with me so much in terms of Dr. Inogo, what you said in terms of the, the, the Maslow's hierarchy. I feel like, the way that I've stepped into 2021 is that I am unapologetic around those basic needs. It's like, am I getting enough water? Am I meditating every other day? Am I running? Am I eating my bowls of salad? Am I consuming good art that brings joy and life to me? And if I don't have those principles, I know I'm going to feel the ap apocalyptic nature of, of the way the system is designed to do all the things that it's doing right now. Um, so, and I think that it is imminent for all of us, everyone in the call to, to realize that those things can contribute to, um, or can, does contribute to change and does contribute to lack of change as well. I, 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 I think, yeah, I think 2020 for sure has taught me that language that I have to fight for those basic needs because they're so important like getting seven to eight hours eight hours of sleep like <laughs> something as simple as that it's like before like when I was in college like that sleep was the last thing that I felt like I needed um now I'm like this is almost a, a like a non-negotiable um so I feel <laughs> like uh, resilience is I don't know I think I've healed it's sort of, sort of like the valley of the darkness it's like you go to the deepest of the darkness and I think collectively this racial enlightenment that happened around conversation with race and or, or, with different industries, whether it's in Hollywood or whether it's in, in technology or, or Wall Street, whatever, wherever in politics, I think a lot of people, that was sort of the valley of darkness for a lot of people that haven't been black, that have not been like people of African descent uh, or minorities. So I don't know, I think resilience is at the center for 2021. Uh, Absolutely. 
I found myself doing a weekly IG live during the period in which I continue to do called Utopia Talks and created it specifically to say, hey, everybody, we've got to keep it moving. <laughs> and keep it moving didn't mean, you know, let's just be overproductive and achieve every goal we ever wanted to achieve like we're on vacation. Uh, keeping it moving was let's, um, let's really ground ourselves, but keep the vision you know, and not capitulate. And so this this visioning or this imagination, uh, I had so much appreciation for people who created amazing art, movies, music, film that I could engage in. Um, so appreciative of all these dance teachers and dances I could do. Uh, and all of this stuff became very interdimensional at some point. Um, but also just this idea of the vision for a future. Um, yeah, I, I think was very, very powerful um, and played a big role and had a very practical nature to it, um, besides just the, the value of imagination for fun, uh, the imaginations for everyone. So we have some really cool questions here. I uh, wanted to run them by you. Uh, one of our questions of uh, one of our attendees is, what sort of manufacturing community or industry would you dream of being formed around some of your Afrofuturist specialties? I mean, I know there's a lot of talk now about, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, certain kind of modeling, uh, 3D printing, um, obviously SpaceX uh, is, is taking off. We have a whole a new industry, space industry. Uh, if I could jump in, you know, I would just, I think in looking at creating some of these new societies in, in space, um, some of the work that people are doing, creating the technologies to get us um, onto Mars or onto other space stations. You know, I would love there to be more thought about the culture, the community, um, and the life that we're creating, what we want to bring with us. And uh, when we start to create these societies and not just the technologies we need to get there, or the value of the, the things we need to mine. Um, <laughs> maybe there should be some of this talk about um, colonization of space sounds like some things we've been through before that didn't have the best of outcomes. So uh, besides the language change, I think there's also a philosophy change that I would appreciate uh, and some thought about um, uh, just the, the multitude of thought uh, philosophically around how to approach creating new societies in these worlds. Um, do either of you have thoughts on certain manufacturing dynamics? And I know someone, the person asking is probably like, hey, that doesn't have anything to do with manufacturing. But I, I think the question of why are we doing what we're doing mm -hmm. as we create these technologies and realizing technology isn't just the quote unquote machinery of the digital space, but it is mm -hmm. thinking. Is yeah. a, a thought processes our technologies, writings of technology. Um, any thoughts, uh, Dr. Nyango or Fabrice, about other manufacturing? Um, I think it's interesting that, like you said, the use of the word manufacturing, just because when I'm thinking about industry, um, honestly, I start to think about education <laughs> mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of the, the complex that has developed around what education is and how radically it needs to be shifted around um, joy, pleasure, exploration, um, liberation. Having taught on an elementary school level and at having taught in a university context, um, it's, it's, you know, students arrive to my class having never been told that they can have a, a thought of their own. And you know, these are 17, 18, 19 year olds, <laughs> you know, individuals who have never, who have only thought in terms of doing the right thing so they can get from point A to point B. So my hope would be a, a radical reimagination of what education even looks like. I don't even know if that would be the term, but <laughs> um, how we usher little people into being big people with skills and ideas and a sense of self and a love and and a sense of their own story I think going back to storytelling that was really missing for me as a kid I think Itasha bringing up you know getting deep into the library and doing that research on your own as a kid you know like that's 
so powerful to me. And I wish that there were was infrastructure for more kids to be able to be able to follow that path when it's when it strikes them. Um, so I think, yeah, education as an industry <laughs> needs to be totally, 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 totally reworked. Yeah, Afrofuturism is a quest for sure. Um, it takes you deeper into inner and outer space, I believe. Um, Fabrice, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I think it, we've spoken a little bit on that in terms of the, the growth mindset that we have in terms of development. And I feel like if we are ever to have something that is sustainable, that is something that is viable, that we need to include black thought, black thinking, um, underrepresented voices that have been left out. Um, I think right now there's a major conversation or reckoning that's happening in Silicon Valley where these major tech companies have felt that they were changing the world and, and creating greater access and opportunities, which we can argue, yes, they definitely have. But I think there's an underlying framework where we're looking at how the technology is built, by whom it is built, and how these in industries and innovative processes are being formed, those biases are seeped out into those industries and in these manufacturing communities or those, those new ways of being in terms of an economy. And I totally agree with you, this idea of colonizing Mars. I, I remember when I first heard that and I like literally wrote a blog about it. I was like, why we should not colonize Mars? I think we're depriving ourselves of we're depriving ourselves of so much magic and potential and sustainability by by using the same language of like of utilitarianism in terms of defining something by its utility and its production and its growth process. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to to bring Afrofuturism and and engaging a more holistic model of growth. Because yes, those industries are not going to go anywhere. Like I have my, I have an Apple iPhone. Like I, those industries are not going to go anywhere. I think they have engaged our life in very meaningful ways. And But I do feel like there's a fundamental need to include Black thoughts, underrepresented voices in th this construction or manufacturing process of those new industries. Right. I, so um, next question here, Afrofuturism is future affirming in a way that white U.S. movements are not. I'm sure some might debate with that, but how is it, how do the positives and negatives of the past propel thought forward and backwards? Is there a folding backwards and forwards of time and experience? Thank you for that question, Heather. And this goes back to, I think, some of the time um, questions that we were sort of talking about. And, and I, I think that goes into some of these philosophies, you know, um, all African, most African ethnic groups have their own sort of maybe systems and practices, and uh, many of which have a relationship to time uh, and, and sort of speak to that. And a, a deep dive into that, I think, are, are pretty interesting. Uh, and in the diaspora, you, you see it threatened in many ways, too. Uh, we had, and there's a folding of this time, you know, now we're getting into quantum physics world. Um, <laughs> I think, um, it, it, I don't know, do you, well, I have some thoughts on it, but I want to see in Dr. Nyango and Fabrice, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think, so the, I was just reading this quote this morning that history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it rhymes, right? That there's, so there's relationships between these moments. And it's not always going to co come out in the same exact way. But we see that there, there are formats, right? There are like formats of ways that historical events unfold. And we see those formats being reproduced. So I mean, I'm, I guess I'm a little unsure about what's meant by the like positives and negatives. Um, I think what's being said is that if there's too much focus on the past, or maybe there's an insinuation if there's too much focus on the past that we can lose sight of possibilities. Um, but I, I mean, I would say that the, the past is endlessly, is necessary for understanding um, people, 
how humans work and think, <laughs> you know, like there's, I, I watch a lot of um, history documentaries and I'm always laughing to myself because it's like these people in 1862 were as petty as, <laughs> you know, they're petty over the same types of stuff. And it's, it's this wonderful affirmation to me is that humans are going to be human, right? And so I think um, that revelation in itself is really powerful. So I, I'm maybe not answering the question, but I, I don't see the negatives in being deeply connected with how folks in the past have moved. Um, you know, it, I think it just involves creating space for like Itasha has with utopia talks and freedom dreaming, just creating space for totally thinking about a, a future that's not um, tethered to any specific historical moment. Right. And that's always a challenge for Breeze. Yeah, I think I'll add a quick thought. I think like for me, it's, it's sort of the metaphor of the, the, the blind man and the elephant. Each of the blind men are touching a different part of the elephant, but they don't know they're touching the elephant or, but only together can they have a bigger, a more understanding of what's the whole. And I think that question is so powerful because it's like, how do we evolve our systems and how do we take the, the quote unquote, the soul feeling, the good sustainable aspects of the past from all cultures, from all sides and create a tapestry or something that is meaningful for the collective. Um, because I, I definitely do not want to romanticize like humanity. We are, we are imperfect species. Um, so I think we're continually having to reassess our culture or ways or behaviors. And I think in, in light of that question is like how, I don't know, I, I don't think I have an answer now, but I do feel it's almost this coming together to, to enable our blind spot. But I think to add a, a caveat into this is the power structures. Um, and I think that's what makes it almost so impossible because if the power structures are, are in, inherently set up to disadvantage of certain groups of people is how do we even, how can we even claim to say that parts of the culture for this disadvantaged groups of people is quote unquote, not honoring of the collective. So I, I think that there's a lot of tensions and complexities in that question. I really appreciate, appreciate that. No, thank you. Uh, and so we have three other questions. We are at the the time in the program where officially we're supposed to wrap up. So I'll, I'll read these, these questions and uh, maybe if we could just kind of get uh, some insight, uh, somewhat abbreviated <laughs> into them, that would be super awesome. Uh, Jasmine wants to know what role do you see Afro-horror speaking to uh, this understanding of the future within the umbrella of Afrofuturism? Just thinking of the popularity that Jordan Peele's movies have gotten in our current moment, uh, and a uh, very cool question um, there. Uh, the term Afro horror is sometimes now called uh, the ethnogothic. So um, you might want to just kind of put that in your notes as well. Um, so what do you think about some of the, the horror stories? And, and, and keep in mind, everything that's speculative doesn't necessarily have to fall under the umbrella of Afrofuturism. Um, there is a larger uh, umbrella of Black speculative thinking um, that includes um, surrealism and Afrofuturism and Anabor, um, or what we're calling the ethnogothic in some ways. Any thoughts on, on that, uh, especially in relationship to dealing with traumas? Yeah, but I would sort of follow up exactly what you said, that it, I think in some ways, uh, Black horror is this way of engaging with unspeakable horror. Um, that there's, again, kind of a format that from, we're familiar with in the horror film that um, we're able to repurpose, remix, <laughs> rework um, in a way that speaks to our lens of the world. And I think framing a lot of Black experiences in terms of horror is an important distinction. Um, like using that bucket to to frame what has often been everyday life for, for Black folks, right? Which are many instances can reflect the horrors of trying to exist in, a, in a, a space where systems are actively trying to kind of crush and, and, and um, disable your ability to move through them. So I think the, the terminology is really important there. Like the genre is doing a lot of work in illuminating um, 
what horror can look like on the everyday and on the structural. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Absolutely. Uh, so the other question, how, this is by Sekou, um, how do we protect against the exploitation and commodification of Afrofuturism and its usage? <laughs> that's a that's a very tough question. Um, and to comment to comment to same as uh, quite uh, about, I'll go to the whole question first. I I do feel that the idea of you leveraging fiction and you leveraging stories as a template it, it encodes so much information in it. It's like I always say it's like it, it's a it's almost like a mythological tool, an ancient tool that can radically reshape people's symbolic structure or meaning structure. So I think horror and understanding our own lived experience, and I think Jordan Peele does such a fa fascinating job on that. Um, in terms of exploitation and commod commodification, I, I don't know. I, 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 think, I think a lot of it has to do with how do we, how do we, because a lot of, okay, so it's like, I think we exist in a very capitalist system and I think there's a lot of unintended consequences because of that. But I do feel like what's coming for me is how do we move that wealth towards underrepresented communities? Um, because I think a lot of the exportation and com commodification is because the, the group of people or that if Afrofuturism is being commodified and exploited, that means that wealth is not going back to the actual creators who are creating this. So I think a way that we can do this is creating more uh, creator owned systems that are that are more outside of the traditional terms of engagement of having a, a single group of, of, of a gatekeeper defining what's happening. And I think we're seeing a lot of change in that. I don't have a specific answer in terms of exportation and com commodification, but I do know like things such as the sharing economy, how technology is decentralizing things. Um, also the work I'm doing with Syllable, I think how do we give more access and opportunities for people to own their ideas and, and connect and create together. Um, and I think, I think for me, the answer lies with wealth, but I'm not exactly sure where I would take it further than that because I think we are enthralled in this, this system of, of capitalism. And I would say too that um, in the same way that the science fiction genre didn't prevent people from thinking about their futures, um, Afrofuturism, uh, even in its, um, you know, even if the artistic aesthetic of it is utilized to create a lot of, you know, cultural product that is commodified in some ways, that it doesn't take away from the fact that it's a practice for people and that they have a relationship to the future and that there's a philosophy behind it. Um, people of African descent and on the continent had a relationship to futures before the term Afrofuturism. And they'll have it um, even, you know, at, at points when it's uh, more accessible to people uh, in, in terms of cultural production and, and music and works and films and so forth. And uh, our next question is, what stories do you think aren't being told or not told enough from an Afrofuturist perspective? And I can jump in just a second uh, for that one. I, you know, some of these stories, I think it's interesting for people to keep in mind that the marketplace, it's only been in recent years that they've been more receptive to stories from this perspective. It's not to say nobody ever thought of any or they didn't talk about any or that they didn't write any, but they were not in the marketplace and accessible to, to various people. So we're really at a moment in time where there's sort of a floodgate of, of new and wonderful stories that are, are starting to, to come into, uh, to become more accessible, widely accessible for people. And that's in part because of the technologies. It's in part because the indie movement and some of these collective movements like the one Fabrice has been a part of. It's in part because of people like Dr. Nyango, who's an indie artist who are just like, hey, I'm making my thing and I'm putting out there. And that led to a cresting, which led to Black Panther, which has led to more interest in the subject matter. So, um, yeah, I think that there's um, there's so many stories to be told. Um, 
because then <laughs> very few have been told um, in a way that we can get access to. Uh, but Dr. Nyanko and Fabrice, are there any cool stories you'd love to see? I mean, I want to echo what you're saying, Natasha, around like, um, like access, because a lot of the time, something that I found as it relates often to like women working within sound is that people will say, oh, there's no, we need to, to work on the pipeline because there's no women who are producers or studio folks. And then you do the tiniest bit of research, right? And there's so many women who are doing this work. There's, they've been there and they'll continue to be there, but folks haven't necessarily done the work to elevate those individuals. So I think maybe the question, rather than like, what stories do we want to be told? It's like, what stories do we want to be have elevated? Because I'm sure the work is being done, just as Itasha and Fabrice have said, you know, these stories have existed before the label, they'll continue into eternity. Um, I would love to see, you know, LGBTQIA stories. Um, myself, I would like to do the work of finding those stories within Afrofuturist um, conversations. But again, I'm, sh I'm willing to bet anything on the fact that these stories exist in a wide variety and in a number of different formats and places but it's incumbent on us as consumers and, and participants in this forum to do the work of finding. And when you love it, tweet about it and Instagram and <laughs> post about it. I just wanna say Itasha is like my favorite person to follow on all platforms because she, she's just emanating with light always. Every post is always just, it keeps folks lifted, I think, and encourages good energy, which is really, really, you know, in short <laughs> supply, I think, these days. So it's really nice to, when you see something that you love, just blast it, blow it up, share it. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that, Dr. Nyango. <laughs> I appreciate that. I try to stay ambulant. <laughs> uh, Fabrice? Yeah, I echo a lot what Dr. Nyango said and you, Natasha. I think, it, I think it, this is a conversation of elevation. I think the stories have existed for eons um, and, and they are being told. I think it's it's how do we elevate those stories to the mainstreams that are sort of moving and shaping our minds or collective minds. Um, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think for me, I totally agree. I think LGBT visions of the future, ways of being outside of the traditional norms. I I think also for Haitian perspective as well. I would call. I, I think there's so much wealth like that of indigenous folks, uh, people from different tribal communities in Africa. Um, there is so much stories that are being told that outside of what we traditionally see, the hero's journey, um, the, the traditional tropes of what that are made. But I think it's, this is a very recent also, I, I have to add the caveat that this is a very recent like development in terms of how it's opening to the mainstream with Black Panther and all of these different ways. So I think we're gonna see more and more and more and more stories from Afrofuturist perspectives being elevated to, um, because they're, they're, those are important. It's just it's just kind of, be, by the fact they're not part of the mainstream, it's almost as, as if the collective consciousness is not whole. It's like, it's like you need the full collective to, to add on to the conversation so we can actually know where we're going in the future. Um, and, and I, because <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think it's so important for, for the future and how it's gonna be defined. So I think I'm a very optimistic person. So I'm an, I'm an eternal optimist. So I do believe the best is yet to come and, and we're living in it now, so. Absolutely, yeah, the uh, claiming and reframing and rethinking about histories uh, for so many people is as much a, uh, a, a brand new horizon um, in the lack of always being taught things, you know, here in the, well, not just here in the U.S., but everywhere with respect to uh, the diaspora and many other people. Uh, so it's a brand new history for many people in some respects um, as the, the future is a, a new frontier of sorts. Um, and again, that's a colonial phrasing, uh, is a new uh, space of claiming uh, and, and re-envisioning. So we have to re-envision all of these things to kind of understand where we are, sometimes even understand things that have happened in the past. 
Uh, and I have to note that, um, you know, Fabrice is a Haitian American. Dr. Nyango said that she had a parent who's from the Ivory Coast um, in Africa. And I'm, um, you know, my family came to Chicago via the Great Migration, Mississippi and Texas. And so I think it's a uh, pretty synergetic that we have somewhat different backgrounds, although we're all uh, American uh, and all of that lens uh, has led us to Afrofuturism. So I have to ask you each, and can you tell us how people can follow you, how they can, you know, continue this conversation around Afrofuturism? Uh, and to that, I mean, if you can give them ways to follow you and maybe suggest maybe a few works they could take a look at. Yours or others. For sure, you can follow me at um, Samus Music, S A M M U S Music um, dot com. Also, all of my social media handles are Samus Music, although I have not been on social media at all over the past several months trying to save my brain, but periodically coming on and being inspired and excited by folks like you, Tasha. Um, but it, in terms of works to check out, I have an EP that I dropped in 2014 that's um, like a uh, what's it called, a concept album about the video game Metroid from which my namesake kind of comes. And so it's told, uh, it's a rap album that's told from the perspective of this um, intergalactic bounty hunter who's in a cybernetic power suit. So that, I think that's a good way into my work and then just listen to everything after that. <laughs> I love how you just kind of threw that in there. <laughs> and also, <laughs> just in case you got a little taste of Afrofuturism, I have this album where <laughs> it's all uh, biotechnology here. Um, yeah, no, that's super awesome. Thank you, Dr. Nyango. Fabrice, uh, can you tell us some of your handles and maybe some other works people can check out, yours or others? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my, I'm, I'm on Twitter, so it's my last name, G-U-E-R-R-I-E-R, -R -E -R, and then first name, F-A-B-R-I-C-E, -E, and you'll find me on Twitter. I also have a personal site as well. It's FabriceGary.com, and you'll find all the different works. I host a podcast as well, the Fabrice Gary Show, and it's, it's specifically around the future, um, interviewing different people in my network and community to understand their visions for the future. Um, in Syllable Studios, you'll find the work of the, uh, the sci-fi fantasy production house, S-Y-L-L-B-L-E.com, and you can explore that site and some of the works that we're doing. One I'm partic particularly excited for is the Orient Paradigm Collective, where writers are actively exploring a world in the year 2400, and, and, and a time of space exploration is more of a space opera, but I, yeah, I'm, 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 it's been absolutely amazing to be here to talk to to two wonderful, amazing, like amazing, amazing um, uh, collaborators and guests here on the show. So I, I really appreciate being here and, and having this conversation around Afrofuturism. Same. I'm so grateful, really. I'm just going to be beaming the whole rest of the week. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, thank you both. Um, you can follow me at Yatasha Womack on Twitter or YatashaWomack.com. And uh, you can go to at YSoulStar on Instagram if you like and uh, check out Utopia Talks each Tuesday at uh, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, keep yourself lifted. As for book recommendations, of course, I'm going to tell you Afro Futures, and if you want more of a grounding than that, Rayla 2212, Rayla 2213 are some favorites if you want some sci-fi, Space Odyssey, and uh, there's another cool book I'm kind of cheerleading for called Infinitum. Uh, that's a, an epic Afrofuturist work created by Tim Fielder. It's a graphic novel, just came out last week. And I think if you're looking for an epic graphic novel, um, it's close to 300 pages, you'll, you'll like this story. Um, so those are just a couple of works. And uh, just a reminder, oh, Megascope, the imprint, I said I was going to bring that up. They have some cool graphic novels coming out too. Um, my book, Black Cube, will be out next year. So, but there's a gazillion books coming out in lieu of that. One of which is, uh, which is already out, is called After the Rain. It's an adaptation of a Nettie Accor for a story that uh, John Jennings adapted, which uh, is surrealist and, and African. And um, 
has a, some elements of horror too. I think you guys will find pretty fascinating. Any of our Lovecraft country fans, um, I think you'll find some interesting moments there. So thank you, Dr. Nyango. Thank you, uh, Fabrice, for being amazing. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here and joining us all. Um, you're super fantastic. Uh, we have to give a special thank you, of course, to Future Tense, which provided this great platform, uh, and New America's event team, who has us literally assembled here from our many parts of the world. Uh, Dr. Inango, Fabrice, if you want to say any quick words uh, before we sign out. <laughs> we're speechless. We're speechless. <laughs> speechless. <laughs> Fantastic. They have time traveled uh, in a space of timelessness, meditating <laughs> on the, the future visions. So thank you all. We hope you all uh, continue to stay lifted and move forward and check out some of the great themes in Afrofuturism, and Dr. Nyango's work and then Fabrice's work and uh, some of the cool things uh, that I've had a chance to participate in as well. Thank you, everybody. You're great. You're amazing. And uh, yes, we are signing out. Stay space-tastic. <laughs>